Stanford University. Let me review first a little bit about, about symmetry breaking in general, how symmetry breaking influences the energy levels of systems. And of course, the energy levels of systems can be translated for our purposes into the masses of particles. And I'm going to do that by a simple example, a simple familiar example. Then I'm going to show you how supersymmetry breaking works in the simple supersymmetric field theory that we, uh, we discussed last time. Discuss a little bit about its relationship with gravity and um, what the implications of supersymmetry and supersymmetry breaking are for gravity and vice versa. And finally, if we still have time, I think we may, start the introduction to, uh, to guts, to grand unified theories. OK, so symmetry breaking. A very, very simple model for symmetry breaking, which really does have all of the physics in it of uh, what we want to talk about is ferromagnets, magnets in general, ferromagnets. Ferromagnets are simply systems which are composed out of little microscopic magnets. We don't have to worry about the fact that they happen to be in a, in a chunk of iron. That's not what's important here. What's important is that the world is made up of this world that exists inside the ferromagnet. Let's think of ourselves as being little creatures that live inside the ferromagnet. Uh, the ferromagnet is composed microscopically, even more microscopic than we are, microscopically of little elementary magnets. And little elementary magnets interact with each other. In a real ferromagnet, they tend to interact with each other at a bit of a distance. The, uh, the nearest neighbor interactions are somewhat augmented by next nearest neighbor interactions and next to next nearest neighbor or interactions and so forth. But a very simple mathematical picture of a ferromagnet is that each little elementary magnet interacts with its neighbor. And if the interaction energy is such that it favors, that means it's lower, if the two neighboring magnets are parallel to each other, then that creates a ferromagnet. If they prefer, meaning energetically, to be anti-parallel, <coughs> then it creates an anti-ferromagnet. And there can be things in between which have no magnetization at all, meaning to say that the magnets are very random and fluctuating and don't tend to, depend, and don't tend to point in any direction at all on the average. Ferromagnets, anti-ferromagnets, and uh, non-magnets. So let's imagine an atom in a magnetic field first. Before we talk about spontaneous symmetry breaking, let's just imagine an atom in a magnetic field. What does a, ma what does a magnetic field do to atoms? Well, even before we talk about the magnetic field, let's just talk about the atom. All right, so the atom may have some angular momentum. Some spin, well, some combined spin, orbital angular momentum, and so forth. And you know that in quantum mechanics, angular momentum along a given direction is quantized. And you know, this is often drawn in elementary textbooks in a way which is somewhat misleading, but let's draw it anyway. You see pictures frequently in chemistry books uh, where you have the possible directions of magnetization. Vertically, you plot some component of the magnetization, of, of the, not the magnetization, some component of the angular momentum, like the z component. You pick out the z component. Why? Uh, because uh, z, um, I don't know. My middle name is Zebulon. <laughs> it is. Uh, and then you say the angular momentum can point in that direction, it can point in that direction, it can point in that direction, it can point in that direction, that direction, or that direction. What happened to all the other directions? Don't worry. The important thing is that the, uh, the, the um, components of magnetization, the components of angular momentum 
as long as the axes are quantized in integer multiples. All right, but they all have the same energy. They all have the same energy, and that's a consequence of rotational invariance. Roughly speaking, I, I missed some, didn't I? I didn't put some down here, too. Uh, roughly speaking, a rotation can take one of these directions of magnetization of angular momentum and rotate it into another. I keep saying magnetization. That's because I keep seeing M up here. Uh, can rotate one direction of angular momentum of the atom into another. And of course, a rotation should not affect the energy of an atom. Why not? What's the symmetry which says that uh, rotation shouldn't affect the energy of an atom? Rotation symmetry. Since we believe in rotation symmetry, if the entire atom were rotated, the energy should be the same. And the implication of that the quantum mechanical implication of that is all these different states have exactly the same energy. In terms of an energy diagram, we could oh, but all the states have the same energy. Okay. There are what? 2j plus 1 of them, where j is the total angular momentum. And they all have exactly the same energy. Now, what happens when you put them into a magnetic field? If the angular momentum has no component. Now, let's imagine now we put it into a magnetic field. So this direction is not just the z direction, but also happens to be the direction of a magnetic field. Uh, then if the atom's component of angular momentum along that direction is positive, the energy may get increased. If negative, the energy may get decreased. And all these levels get split a little bit. Let's see. Linear in the external, linear in the external, in the magnetic field. Linear in the magnetic field. What's this uh, phenomena called? Anybody know? The splitting of atomic levels in a magnetic field. The Zeeman effect. The Zeeman effect. Right. It uh, has been known for over a hundred years, I believe. I think, um, and. Of course, this changes spectral lines. Spectral lines, uh, new spectral lines emerge. You can have a transition from here to here. Well, not, not very easily. But transitions to other states can be all split and uh, mucked up. But the important thing is that the energies of states which were otherwise in the absence of that magnetic field exactly equal because of symmetry are split among themselves by a process of symmetry breaking by the magnetic field. Okay. Now, supposing that the magnetic field is actually due to this ferromagnet that's filling space. A ferromagnet is an example of spontaneous symmetry breaking. You realize that when you ask the question, which direction does the ferromagnet point in? Which direction, when the energy is as low as possible, does the ferromagnet point in? And the answer is it could point in any direction. As long as all the little magnets are lined up, the energy is the same. And so there's no preferred direction. That's rotational symmetry. All ferromagnets, no matter what direction they point in, have exactly the same energy. And if there's nothing else around to pick out a direction of space, the only thing that picks out the direction of space is the ferromagnet, is the orientation of the ferromagnet. So for that reason, all of the ferromagnets, no matter which way they're pointing, are physically identical to each other, even though from some abstract outside point of view they're pointing in different directions. There would be no difference between them for creatures that live inside the ferromagnet. However, Supposing one of these creatures happens to be an atom, an ordinary atom, and it's under the, it's interacting with the ferromagnet. So here's the magnet, here's the uh, atom. The magnetic field of the ferromagnet happens to be pointing in this direction, this way. That will have exactly the same effect as the external magnetic field. It's just a, a, a mathematical magnetic field, and it will split the atomic levels. 
All right, it'll split them according to the z component of their angular momentum. But what happens if the magnetic field is pointing in another direction? Just as good a direction, say that way. Well, from the point of view of the atom, there's no difference. Its levels get split. It's not the z component of angular momentum which determines the splitting. It's the component along the magnetic field. And exactly the same pattern emerges. Uh, with the atomic levels split like this. So um, the ferromagnet simulates, if you like, the effect of explicit symmetry breaking. Explicit symmetry breaking would mean that the world was fundamentally not rotationally symmetric. Of course it is. And that's, uh, that's confirmed by the fact that you could rotate the whole ferromagnet and everything would be the same. In other words, the symmetry involves not only rotating the magnet, but also rotating the entire world's worth of, uh, of uh, little magnets. Somebody inside this ferromagnet, of course, cannot do the experiment. Creatures made up out of the little excitations of the ferromagnet could not do this experiment of rotating the entire magnetic field. So they would say, well, it looks to us like the world breaks the symmetry of rotational invariance. But what is the difference? What kind of experiment could be done from inside the ferromagnet to confirm that this was a case of spontaneous symmetry breaking rather than just the world being uh, asymmetric? And the answer is, the answer revolves around this phrase that we've used before, Goldstone bosons. Let me remind you what a Goldstone boson is. First of all, if you take all the magnets and rotate everything, it costs no energy at all. But now supposing you do something a little different. Very slowly as you move through space, slowly means uh, slowly in space, very, very slowly and gradually, you imagine changing the direction of the magnets. Right? Um, it's not going to stay that way. The magnets which are aligned over here are going to pull the neighboring ones into the same direction, and it's going to create waves. It's going to create waves. Those waves, or the quanta of those waves, are called Goldstone bosons. But the interesting implication is that when the wave is very, very long wavelength, extremely long wavelength, in this case, they would be called spin waves or magnons. Magnons, rotations, gradual rotations of the magnetic, uh, of the direction of the magnetic field. Those magnons, the very, very long wavelength ones, would cost arbitrarily small energy. The longer their wavelength, the less the energy they cost. Because after all, if the wavelength was infinite, that would be exactly the same as rotating everything. And that costs no energy. Long wavelength means low momentum. And excitations which have no energy or whose energy goes to zero as the wavelength gets longer and longer are called massless. Massless particles are the ones whose energy decreases as the wavelength gets longer and longer or as the momentum gets smaller and smaller. So a person living inside this ferromagnet or perhaps two people living inside this ferromagnet, one over here, one over here, could send messages to each other by wiggling the, uh, wiggling, somehow grabbing hold of their local, they can't grab a hold of all of the magnets and rotate them, but they can grab a hold of a couple of magnets nearby and wiggle them a little bit. And the effect of that wiggling a little bit will be to create spin waves or magnons and those magnons can propagate from one, uh, from one person to another, can send messages with them. And those people living in this ferromagnet, after they've done lots of experiments with these spin waves, will conclude from experiment that those spin waves are massless, that it costs no energy to make very, very long wavelength ones. If they were smart, they would conclude that they're living in a world of spontaneous symmetry breaking and not 
that the fundamental properties of the world are asymmetric. It's just that the world that they live in, the energies are such that it tends to align everything, but it doesn't matter which direction things align in. That's the basic phenomenon of spontaneous symmetry breaking. It does not have to necessarily have to do with uh, rotations of real space. It could have to do with all of or all of or any of the internal symmetry groups of particle physics. In particular, things like SU3 cross SU2 cross U1 and so forth. One of the things that we learned, incidentally, is that there's a kind of interaction between gauge forces and Goldstone bosons, which has an effect which I'll come to, which I'll remind you of later. Anybody remember what the effect of mixing up together uh, spontaneous symmetry breaking and gauge invariance was? Goldstein uh, boson went away and became an extra uh, uh, parameter for the, uh, uh, for the gauge, gauge boson. boson. Became, that's right. It, it turned the gauge boson into a massive thing instead of massless. And we'll come back to this. We'll come back to this theme. But I just want to remind you of it. That was the pattern or the idea of spontaneous symmetry breaking, continuous spontaneous symmetry breaking. There's also another mathematical statement one can make. The vacuum, of course, being the state of lowest energy, is just any one of these configurations where the magnets in this, in this particular context, of course, of a ferromagnet, where all the uh, ferromagnets aligned along the same direction. There's a, there's a vacuum for that direction. There's a vacuum for that direction. There's a vacuum for that direction. Nobody in the world is big enough to get outside and make a rotate from one to the other. So all of physics takes place in one of them. And the people living in that vacuum in that world call that configuration the vacuum. OK, so there are many vacuums. Uh, let's take the vacuum that they live in, and let's apply to it the symmetry operation. The symmetry operation means the generators of the symmetry. What are the generators of rotation symmetry? The components of the angular momentum. Angular momentum, sometimes I call it J, sometimes I call it L. Let's call it J right now, since it consists of all the angular momentum of everything. Let's call it J. And what does J do when it acts on a state? It infinitesimally rotates it a little bit, right? It infinitesimally rotates it a little bit. If the vacuum state was such that it really was symmetric, that it really didn't have this kind of spontaneous symmetry breaking, what would, hap what would happen uh, if you were uh, if you rotated the state a little bit, it would come back to itself, right? Now, you have to remember that this is, uh, this is the difference between the J really represents the difference between the rotation and the non-rotated state. It's the little infinitesimal change in the state that's made by, uh, by a small rotation. J corresponds to a small change in the state. If the state, the vacuum state, was symmetric, then when you apply J to it, nothing happens. And the right-hand side is just zero. No change whatever in the state. Uh, from a formal mathematical point of view, the signal of spontaneous symmetry breaking is that J, when it acts on the vacuum, doesn't give zero. It gives a state which is slightly rotated. So not equal to 0 means that the, that the vacuum has a spontaneous symmetry breaking. Now, we're going to see that pattern repeat itself in supersymmetry, with the exception, of course, that the symmetry or the generators are these fermionic objects. Oh, incidentally, what, let's, uh, let's suppose that J on the vacuum, rotate the vacuum, does not give 0. Then what does it give? What does it give? Well, it has the same vacuum. It doesn't give the same vacuum. It gives a slightly rotated one. 
But the slightly rotated one is equivalent to putting into the system an infinitely long wavelength Goldstone boson. So you could say that J on the vacuum creates a very, very long wavelength, infinitely long wavelength Goldstone boson. Does J on the vacuum change the energy? No, it just rotated the vacuum a little bit. And so J, when it acts on the vacuum, we can write here that it gives a Goldstone boson state. Let's call it a GB. It gives a Goldstone boson state. And the fact that rotating the vacuum doesn't cost any energy at all tells us that the Goldstone boson has no energy. This is the pattern. Uh, one more point. All these points are important. The magnetization of the ferromagnet is described by a little vector, by a vector. It's a vector at each point of space, and so it can be thought of as a field. It's the local properties of the, uh, of the ferromagnet. And that little vector, of course, is nothing but the direction of the little magnetic moments that are making up the direction and magnitude of the magnetic moments that are making up the ferromagnet. And you can call it M. It's not the same M. Let's call it capital M. Capital M, and it's a vector. It points along the axis of the, uh, of the ferromagnets. Um, if M is 0, that could be the case, for example, in a warm ferromagnet. If you heat a ferromagnet up, then the magnets uh, fluctuate. On the average, they, uh, there's no net magnetization. In quantum mechanics, it just may be that uh, quantum fluctuations wash out uh, the magnetization. If m equals 0, that's the situation where we say the vacuum is symmetric. There is no magnetization. If any component of m is not equal to 0, that's another way to represent spontaneous symmetry breaking. If any component of m is not equal to 0, then the system is magnetized along that direction. And if you rotate that component, other components will, uh, will become non-zero. All right, so if the Z component is non-zero and you rotate the ferromagnet, the X component may, may become non-zero or the Y component may become non-zero. So all of these things are the mathematical and physical uh, correlates of the idea of spontaneous symmetry breaking. OK, now let's review a little bit about Supersymmetry, and I'm going to add a little bit to it. We're not, uh, I haven't finished torturing you yet, tormenting you. We're going to add just a little bit. If we want to do it, we've got to do it. Let's just review. We worked out a, symbol, a single example of a supersymmetric quantum field theory, or a supersymmetric field theory. Um, it involved one fermion and one boson field, and I'll just remind you about it. Uh, It involved a superfield that I called capital Phi. And capital Phi had the property of being a chiral superfield. I won't bother you with a definition of that now, but the important thing about the chiral superfield is that in one form or another, it really only depends on two variables, y and theta. And I'll just remind you, just to put up the equations here, y was equal to the ordinary coordinate x plus i theta bar sigma theta. And that was called a chiral superfield. Okay? It's also complex. It's important that it's complex. And if you wanted to try to make it real, what you would find is that a supersymmetric transformation would generate an imaginary part. So it's not consistent with supersymmetry to say that it's real. That was phi, and we introduced a Lagrangian for phi, first a super Lagrangian. The super Lagrangian, I think I indicated by a capital lambda. And it's a thing which you integrate with respect to space, space time, and with respect to the thetas. One term 
was integrated with both respect to thetas and their complex conjugate. We could call it d fourth theta, but I'll, I'll indicate explicitly that it was an integral over both the thetas and the theta bars. And in the simple example that I worked out for you, lambda was just equal to phi star times phi And I'm not going to do it again. I'm just going to tell you what came out. Oh, what happens? What do you do? Yeah. Remember what phi was. Let's just write down what phi was. Phi was a sum of several terms, the first term being an ordinary scalar field, the next term being a fermion field times theta, and the last term I called f times theta theta, theta 1, theta 2, or however you like to think about it. These were the three components of a superfield, phi, psi, and f. Okay. Those were the three components of the superfield. If you plug that into the formula here and integrate with respect to the thetas, what does integrating with respect to the thetas mean? It means picking out the last term of the expression. When you multiply phi star times phi, you will get a term with f theta, theta, theta bar, theta bar. When you multiply these together, you will get a term with four thetas altogether. And if you work it out carefully, keeping track of the details, what we found was that this became just the ordinary action for a scalar field and an ordinary fermion field. In other words, this gave rise to an action which was the integral dx of, what did it have? It had partial of phi with partial of phi star with respect to x mu, partial of phi with respect to x mu. That's just the ordinary Lagrangian uh, of a scalar field. I won't bother, I'm not gonna keep track of detailed numerical factors. We've seen this before. If we varied that with respect to phi, we would get the simple Klein-Gordon equation. Next, there was a term that was psi bar uh, sigma derivative of psi. That's just the Klein, that's just the uh, Dirac or the, um, the massless fermion Lagrangian. And finally, there was another term which was just f star f. Why just f star f? When you square this, or when you multiply it by its conjugate, you'll get a term f times f star theta, theta, theta bar, theta bar, and so that's also here. <laughs> that's what we got, and that was the starting point. Do you remember what we added to that in order to uh, get some interactions and some mass terms and so forth? We added something that only involved phi and not phi star. For example, phi squared. We added to the Lagrangian or the super Lagrangian phi squared, for example. Now phi squared has no theta bar dependence at all. It only has theta. So if we tried to integrate it over all four components of theta, we would get zero. We would get zero. The right thing to do in this case is just to integrate it with two thetas d theta, let's call it d squared theta. In other words, to pick out the term of phi squared, which has two thetas in it. So I'm going to show you how to do that more generally. We did this. The effect of it was to give us a mass for the particles. Just to just review from last time. But I'm going to work it out in more generality. Instead of writing phi squared here, I'm going to write any function of phi. But before I do any function of phi, Let's be a little more modest for the moment and just take phi to the nth power. Later on, we can add together 
terms with different powers. This is uh, a fairly Phi to the nth, we can add up different ends and uh, make a Taylor series expansion of a function as long as the function is Taylor series expandable. So let's take Phi to the n, put that in here, d2 theta, and see if we can figure out what kind of ordinary Lagrangian for the usual, for the Phi, Psi, and F come out of it. And this is not hard. This is pretty easy, but I have to do it each time over again because I get confused. So let's just take phi plus psi theta plus f theta theta and multiply it together n times. Okay, let's multiply it together n times. Phi plus psi theta plus f theta theta. We're going to multiply them. Dot, 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 dot. Phi plus psi theta plus f theta theta. And what are we looking for? We're looking for the terms which have two thetas. Only the terms which have two thetas will be interesting because those are the only ones that survive when you integrate it over theta. All right, so which kind of terms? There's really only two terms here, only two kinds of terms in all this multiplication here which have two thetas. The first comes from multiplying a product of phi's with one f. Pick out one of the f's here and multiply it by all the remaining phi's. How many such terms are there? n minus 1. n minus 1. N mi uh, oh, sorry, n. n. n terms. You can pick this f, you can pick this f, you can pick this f, you can pick any one of them, and then multiply by all the remaining phi's. So there's a term which is, it contains n times f times phi to the n minus 1. Uh, yeah, phi to the n minus 1, right? Hmm? I think that's right. And, that, and that's the important term for us now, but let me just tell you what the other term is. Then there's a term which is product, uh, product of two psi's and all the rest phi's. Two psi's and all the rest phi's. How many such terms are there? Which is? n times n minus 1 over 2. So there's another term here, which is n times n minus 1 over 2, phi to the n minus 2, times psi bar, psi, times psi psi or something, psi psi, I guess. Incidentally, you also have to add the complex conjugate. So we also add the complex conjugate to this. OK, let me, let me write this for you in a slightly different way. What is n times phi to the n minus 1? Yeah. Is it phi to the n? Where? Phi to the n minus 2, yeah. Just phi to the n with nothing. Where, here? From, yeah, just from the first term all the way to the n times. One of the no, one of the factors is f. You're talking about this term? Hmm? You there's asking term, about? There's a term of nothing. No, 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 no. When you, when you go to integrate over theta, it always picks out the term with two thetas, right? OK, good. And this arrow doesn't mean, well, it, it doesn't mean equals. It means that the term with two thetas that is picked out is the sum of these two. And that's it, plus the complex conjugate, plus the complex conjugate. All right, there's another way to write this. It's, it's exactly the same thing, but let's just uh, look at it. n times phi to the n minus 1. The original superpotential, this is called the superpotential, incidentally. This is called the superpotential. The superpotential, uh, and I'll write it as v with a uh, sort of Roman uh, substantial looking v. It's a function of phi. And in this case, it is just phi to the n for this particular case. Well, if v is phi to the n, what is n times phi to the n minus 1? This, this phi here is a little different than this phi. This phi here is just the first term from the superfield. 
This V of phi is a formal expression involving the full superfield. But if the function V is the nth power, then what is n times the variable to the n minus first power? Derivative. It's the derivative. It's the derivative. So we can write then that the, um, the term that we get out in the action after we integrate over thetas, first of all, has f times the derivative of v with respect to phi. Now, what happens if I have more terms with different powers of n and coefficients in front of them? Each one adds to this, but it still adds just dv by d phi. Uh, this is a linear operation here. If we add terms to v, v more terms with other powers of n, nevertheless, what we will get will be f times the derivative of v with respect to phi. So whatever v is, if somebody gives you a v, you come back and you say that adds to the action f times dv by d phi. And you'll be right. You also have to add in the complex conjugate, f star uh, d v star by d phi star. All right. Good. Also, what about this term here, n times n minus 1 over 2 times phi to the n minus 2? So that involves the second derivative. That involves the second derivative of v. It's 1 half the second derivative of v times psi bar psi. But I'm not going to write it down because I'm not interested in the things that involve the fermions right now. I'm only interested in the things that involve the boson field phi. All right, there's also things involving the fermion field. They're important. Uh, but for the moment, I don't want to write them down. Just leave them here. OK, for example, if v was phi squared, then dv d phi would just be proportional to phi. If v was phi cubed, there would be a phi squared here, and so forth and so on. All right, now, f is a peculiar thing. It only enters into the Lagrangian. It has no, no kinetic term. There's no derivatives associated with it. That means the equations of motion for f don't involve derivatives. They're extremely simple, the equations of motion. They're just algebraic equations for f without any derivatives. And you might as well solve them and eliminate f. To do that, you write down that the total Lagrangian, insofar as it involves f, involves this coming from the d2 theta term and plus f star f coming from this term. And now you have the full dependence of the Lagrangian on this, so what's called an auxiliary field. It's auxiliary because we're going to get rid of it. I'm not sure that auxiliary always means that the auxiliary fire department. I don't suppose that means you're going to get rid of it. But uh, I will use the term auxiliary to mean we're going to get rid of it. All right, f times dv d phi plus f star dv d phi star. And now let's look, what is the equation of motion for f? Well, the usual equation of motion, it involves stuff like derivative with respect to x mu times the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to derivative of f with respect to x, blah, blah, blah. And then plus, minus, minus derivative of Lagrangian with respect to f equals 0. In this case, it's very simple. The Lagrangian doesn't depend on the derivatives of f. So this isn't here. And our equation of motion is just that the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to f is equal to 0. Boy, is that simple. Let's write it out. What does it say? The derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to f has dv by d phi. And plus f star equals 0. In other words, it immediately, and incidentally, the equation of motion for f star, you can just get by taking the complex conjugate of that, of this, 
and it's the derivative of V with respect to phi star superpotential plus F is equal to zero. Let's see, one of these should be complex conjugated over here. Well, both of them are trivially solved. The equations of motion just tell us that F star is nothing but minus dv d phi. And the complex conjugate. In other words, wherever you saw f, you can eliminate it and put in dv d phi. OK, where do we see f in the action? We see the action here, f star f. We see f star times dv star d phi star. But what is, what is f star? f star is dv d phi. So this is also going to give us dv d phi times dv star d phi star. Same kind of term as this one will. And this one will, and the other one here will give us exactly the same kind. In fact, two of them have minus signs and one of them have plus signs. The minus signs come from here. Minus signs and dv d phi are minus f star. So, what's that? You wrote the wrong phi in the derivative. Oh, yes, you're right. Right, f star is minus dv d phi. So both of these terms here are going to have negative signs, and this one will have a positive sign. The net result is that all of this adds up to a potential energy for the phi field. It's in the Lagrangian. It's a term, a potential energy. I won't call, it's not super potential. It's just ordinary potential energy. And what is it? Let's just call it ordinary v now of little phi, not the superpotential, and it is just f star f, or just dv by d phi absolute value squared. In other words, f times f star. So if somebody tells you, let's do an example. Let's do an example. Supposing I give you that the superpotential is, here it is, v is equal to m times phi squared. m times uh, big phi squared. But at this point, it doesn't matter if big phi or little phi. Uh, what is dv d phi? dv d phi is just m, as I said, I'm not going to keep track of factors of 2 today. Apart from a factor of 2, dv d phi is just proportional to m times phi. And what about the potential dv by d phi squared? This is small phi here, it's small phi dv d phi squared just gives us an m squared phi star phi. That's a mass term. That's a mass term which, when added to the Klein-Gordon Lagrangian here, would give the Klein-Gordon particle a mass, would give the scalar particle a mass. All right, so that's an example. We worked that one out last time. What happens if you were to have added a phi cubed term. Then this would become m phi squared. Again, not worrying about numerical coefficients. The phi d phi would be m phi squared. And the ordinary potential would be v would be, let's call this g now, not m, g coupling constant. This would be g squared phi squared, phi star squared. This would correspond to a Feynman diagram in which two particles came in and two particles went out, a phi to the fourth term. So if the whole upshot is that if you're given a superpotential, you can read off from it very quickly what the ordinary potential 
energy of the field is, just derivative of the super potential squared, or absolute value squared. That's a very simple process. That's what you have to know about supersymmetric quantum field theory to have to understand a little bit about um, uh, uh, about supersymmetry breaking. Let's plot vertically the ordinary potential energy, not the super potential. The super potential and the ordinary potential, notice that they're quite different. The ordinary potential energy involves the derivative of the super potential squared, but once you've got it, you've got it. So let's plot V of phi. Notice, first of all, that it's always positive. Where is it? Here. Well, it doesn't have to always be positive. What else can it be? Could be zero, right? Could be zero. But it can't be negative. It can't be negative. All right, so the potential as a function of phi, I'm, uh, I'm being schematic. Phi uh, is a complex variable. I can't draw a potential as a function of a complex variable. Uh, it's a function of phi star phi. But let's just be schematic. It uh, could have a minimum someplace. The minimum is where the vacuum is. The minimum of the potential energy is the vacuum in a field theory. The minimum value of the potential energy is the ground state. Uh, and that's the, uh, and that's where the theory likes to sit at rest uh, in the vacuum. All right, one possibility is that the, uh, that the minimum of the potential happens to be at exactly the bottom here, at v equals 0. The meaning of that is that the vacuum has no energy at all. The vacuum, the energy of the vacuum, the potential energy of the vacuum is 0. The kinetic energy has to do with time derivatives and space derivatives. In the vacuum, those are not there. So the vacuum energy in this case would be exactly 0. What does that imply? That implies that at the minimum, at the place where dv d phi equals 0, v is also 0. Or in other words, that at the minimum, dv d phi has to be equal to 0. Well, also uh, the complex conjugate. Why, why do I say that? For this to be 0, each factor in here has to be 0. For a thing to be 0, if it's a, if it's a, if it's a thing times its own complex conjugate, then the thing inside the, the, this also has to be 0. OK, so if there is a vacuum with 0 energy, then it says that dv d phi is equal to 0. But remember what dv d phi is. It's the f term in the expansion of the superfield. In other words, it's a component of the superfield. It's a component of the superfield. And what it says is, well, what it says is that component of the superfield is 0 in the vacuum. But it also says that the vacuum is supersymmetric. Why? Because for something to not be symmetric, some component, in the case of angular momentum and in the case of the magnetic field, what we said is if the vacuum has a component of the, of the magnetic field which is not equal to 0, then that breaks the symmetry. In the same way, if a component, in particular the last component of a superfield, is not equal to 0, that breaks the symmetry. Why? Because these different components get mixed up into each other under a supersymmetric transformation. So if f is in the same way that the components of the angular momentum get mixed up with each other, or the magnetization get mixed up with each other under a rotation, the same thing happens uh, to the components of a superfield. This statement here is equivalent to saying that the vacuum is supersymmetric. What's the other possibility? The other possibility is that the minimum of the potential, this is not equal to 0. If that's the case, then you can make two conclusions. The first is 
that the energy of the vacuum is not going to be zero. The vacuum will have some energy. Who cares about vacuum energy? The only people who care about vacuum energy are ones who worry about gravity. If you don't worry about gravity, vacuum energy is, has no implication whatever. Right? But if you do worry about gravity, vacuum energy is something to worry about. It means that the vacuum gravitates. Okay, so vacuum energy is a dangerous thing. But if dv d phi is not equal to zero, then that says that the vacuum has an F term. It has a non-zero component of the superfield, roughly speaking, pointing in some direction in superspace. And a super transformation will kind of rotate that. It will correspond to supersymmetry breaking. All right, so if this is not equal to zero, then supersymmetry is broken by the vacuum. It's spontaneous symmetry breaking. The theory itself was supersymmetric. The vacuum simply has an energy in it. That energy explicitly uh, would gravitate if this was a gravitating theory. But um, the important thing is, if you work out all of the details of the equations, you will also find, in that case, that it behaves like a magnetic field. F, F is kind of like a component of a magnetic field, and it has the effect of splitting the masses of the different particles which rotate into each other under the supersymmetry transformation. Which are the particles which rotate into each other under the supersymmetry transformation? The fermions and the bosons. So in, <laughs> the main lesson to draw from this is that there is a theory of supersymmetry breaking which is very close in spirit to spontaneous symmetry breaking, to conventional spontaneous symmetry breaking. It does not require the equations to be not supersymmetric. It requires the solutions of the equations to somehow be non-symmetric with respect to the supersymmetry. And the result is, just like in the magnet, the atom in the magnet will have split levels in the same way the analog of the, uh, of the part of the atom in the magnet would be a fermion or a boson, a particle, and the two things which are interchanged by the supersymmetry will have their energies split, the fermions and the bosons. That's the implication of all of this. One more implication. If the vacuum is not supersymmetric, if the vacuum is not supersymmetric, the simple implication of that, just in the, in the same way if the vacuum is not rotationally symmetric, then a rotation of the vacuum gives you something new, gives you something which is not the vacuum. It gives you a Goldstone boson. What happens if the vacuum of supersymmetry transformation is not symmetric under supersymmetry? Then a supersymmetry transformation on the vacuum gives you something new. Anybody want to guess what that something new is? Well, remember that supersymmetry transformations interchange bosons and fermions. The vacuum is formally counted as a boson state. It's formally counted as a boson state. But whatever the vacuum is, a rotation by a supersymmetry transformation will change it by adding a fermion. A supersymmetry transformation always takes, always adds or subtracts a fermion. So the result is that whenever supersymmetry is spontaneously broken in this way, there is a massless particle. And the massless particle is a fermion instead of a boson. It's what happens to the vacuum when you do the supersymmetry transformation. If the vacuum is symmetric, then you don't get anything new. If the vacuum is not symmetric under supersymmetry, which means that this is not equal to 0, then when you do a supersymmetry transformation, you do get something new. And that new thing is a massless fermion. It has a name. 
Uh, sometimes it's called the Goldstone Fermion instead of a Goldstone Boson, that makes sense. And sometimes it's called a Goldstino. Eno usually refers to a Fermion. The Goldstino or the Goldstone Boson That's the particle that's generated by doing a small supersymmetry transformation on the vacuum if the vacuum is not symmetric. So the two consequences of spontaneous supersymmetry breaking, there are two of them. One is that the vacuum energy is not 0. The minimum is not when v is equal to 0. or. or That's one. So the vacuum energy is not equal to 0. And the other consequence is that there's a massless fermion, a new massless fermion, unexpected. And as, um, as unexpected as a Goldstone boson, and there for the same reasons, that the supersymmetry transformation acting on the whole world has to give you a new state. And that new state is called the Goldstone fermion. OK. That's uh, spontaneous supersymmetry breaking in a nutshell. One more, well, there are two more points. I mean, I'm giving you some, I want to give you some jargon now so that you'll recognize the jargon. Um, the atom by itself, call that a sector of the theory. The atom interacts with the ferromagnet. Call the ferromagnet another sector of the theory. If the magnetic field of the ferromagnet were exceedingly strong, it would do something awful to the atom. The atom would be unrecognizable. It would make spaghetti out of it. Do you know what an atom looks like when it's in an incredibly strong magnetic field? Into a long, stringy, uh, spaghetti-ish looking thing. Right. The atom would be unrecognizable. Uh, but if the magnetic field is very weak, then the atom is quite recognizable. And what you would say, and, and that's the situation we're going to be interested in, the situation where the magnetic field due to the ferromagnet, we're not interested in ferromagnets, but, uh, but by analogy, the magnetic field of the ferromagnet is very weak. The atoms are ordinary atoms, and their levels are only slightly split. The reason we're interested in that situation is because Compared to the fundamental scale of particle physics, string theory, grand unified theories, or anything like that, which tends to be up at you know, 16 orders of magnitude larger than the particle physics scale, the splitting of the superpartners is hoped to be very small. It's hoped that the superpartners have almost the same mass on that scale as ordinary particles. That would be analogous to the magnetic field due to the ferromagnet being very weak and only splitting these particles a little bit. If the magnetic field were very weak, the atoms would hardly notice it. They would hardly notice it. They would hardly interact with those magnetic fields. And in fact, one of the consequences of this would be that it's rather hard by manipulating the atom by manipulating the atom to, uh, to influence the ferromagnet. They're too weakly coupled. And so manipulating the atom would not be likely to stir up spin waves, would not be likely to stir up these, uh, the, uh, the properties of the ferromagnet itself. And in the language that we use, the ferromagnet would correspond to what's called a hidden sector. It's a hidden sector in that uh, unless uh, this was a very sophisticated atom, it wouldn't even notice the, uh, the, magnetic, the, the ferromagnet. It would just be tiny, tiny splittings, and uh, the ferromagnet would be a hidden sector. In the same way, particle physics, supersymmetric quantum mechanics also requires hidden sectors and additions of new objects and new particles in order to break the supersymmetry. It's not a pretty business. Uh, it's a contrived business. You have to add particles. You have to add fields. By the time you're finished, you have a rather complicated construction. 
and the complicated construction is necessary to split among the fermions and the bosons. That's, uh, and the ingredient which does it is often called a hidden sector. It's the thing which precipitates the, uh, the symmetry breaking. Those are some words that, uh, that go along with supersymmetry. Um, yes, one last point. One last point before we leave supersymmetry altogether. Well, not altogether, but for, for tonight. Gravity has an effect on this whole story. Gravity has an effect on this whole story, and it's a significant effect. Um, what? First of all, this has an effect on gravity, and second of all, gravity has an effect on it. What is the effect of a positive vacuum energy if supersymmetry is broken, it says that dv d phi is not equal to zero, and it says that the vacuum energy is not zero. What does a non-zero vacuum energy, and in particular a positive non-zero vacuum energy, do to the world? Okay, what does it do to the world? Well, cosmological. yeah, it's a cosmological constant. It goes into the equations of gravity as a source on the right-hand side of gravity. And it causes um, accelerated expansion of the universe. And very rapid, if the particle physics scales here were ordinary particle physics scales, it would be a very rapid uh, inflation or a very rapid acceleration of the universe. And it would be quite intolerable if the scales that appeared here where anything like the scales that appear in the standard model or anything or the supersymmetric version of it. Uh, and so this is a bad thing. This is not a good thing to have a vacuum energy in a theory or a large vacuum energy in a theory. And this vacuum energy would be quite large if it was what we relied on to split the particles. If it was what we relied on to split the particles, this vacuum energy would be huge, and it would completely uh, destroy any possibility of this theory being right. I'm going to tell you a fact, or a couple of facts. One is the effect of gravity on this equation right here. The effect of gravity on this equation right here is to add, or actually to subtract, another term. This other term is uh, do I have the Planck mass in the right place, or do I have it upside down? Oh boy, it's going to take me an hour to figure out. Um, uh, da, 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 da. Mm, d phi squared. I think um, I think the added term is minus three. Now, don't worry about the three. The three is not it. I promised you I wouldn't put in numbers. This is the one I happen to remember. Not important, though. And I think it's the Planck mass times V of phi. That's something that gravity adds to this. Don't ask why. It's very complicated. It's exceedingly complicated. You have to build theories of gravity that have supersymmetry. That's an extremely complicated story. We won't even try. But the net result is that gravity adds a term here. The effect of that term can be to shift the potential up and down. In particular, if you're very lucky, it can shift it down to something close enough to zero that the cosmological constant is the small number we know. So gravity is a thing that can come to the rescue and get rid of the vacuum energy here. As I said, it's very complicated. I'm not going to try even uh, to, I'm not even sure I understand it. Um, but. Uh, a bad situation is rescued by coupling uh, the supersymmetric field theory to what's called supergravity, hard stuff. The other thing is a little easier to understand, but not easy to understand. 
but still easier to understand. It has to do with this, um, it's, it's related to the Higgs phenomena. And the Higgs phenomena had the property that it took the Goldstone boson and combined it together with the gauge boson and made the gauge boson massive. So let me just uh, say a few words about that. This is something is a little bit easier to understand. Um, if you have a particle of spin j, or spin, yeah, let's say spin j, how many states does it have? Well, the answer is 2j plus 1. How many spin states? 2j plus 1. So for example, if the spin of a particle is 1, the photon has spin 1. Any gauge boson has spin 1, then it has three states, right? 2j plus 1 is three states, and so forth and so on, depending on the spin of the particle. Now, a photon only has two spin states. And that's connected with the fact that it's massless. All right, so let's, let's say some things about uh, particle masses and spins and so forth. Um, supposing I told you that, let's not take an electron. Yeah, let's, uh, let's, let's suppose the photon were massive. Let's suppose the photon were massive. And I told you it only has two spin states, namely spin along its direction of motion as a spin vector pointing along the direction of motion or the spin vector pointing opposite to the direction of motion. It has spin one, but only two states. Okay. If the, um, let's see, how do I want to say this? Then you would tell me there's something inconsistent about this. You would say, if the photon has a mass, you can Lorentz transform it, or equivalently run along and keep up with the photon so that it has no momentum, but a spin. Lorentz transforming it doesn't change the fact that it's spinning. So let's take this spin state here and Lorentz transform it so that we're moving up along with it. The photon no longer has any momentum, but it has a spin. And now, Lorentz transform it in, an in this direction here. What have we made? We've made a photon whose spin is not along its direction of motion. Okay. All right, so we brought it to rest and then transformed it in some other direction. So therefore, if the photon is massive, it has to have all three spin states. It has to have spin along its axis, spin opposite to its axis, and uh, the third spin state also. On, on the other hand, if the photon is massive, massless, you can't bring it to rest. You can't bring it to rest. You can't do this operation. All you can do is rotate the entire state of the photon without bringing it to rest. And all that does is simultaneously rotate the momentum and the spin. So if the spin was initially along the axis of the motion of the, of the photon, it will stay that way. The upshot is massless particles, or a massless photon, for example, can have and does have only the two spin states along its axis and opposite to its axis. How does the gauge bosons, how do the gauge bosons of the electroweak theory get another component of spin? It would be the component of spin along the direction of motion where the spin along the direction of motion was 0. Plus 1, minus 1, and no spin along the z-axis at all altogether. Where does that extra component of the spin come from uh, so that uh, the photon, or not the photon, but let's say the z boson or the w boson can be massive? Where does it come from? And it comes from the Goldstone boson. The Goldstone boson, together with the two polarization states, the two spin states of the massless Z and W, combine together and make enough states to be the massive Z and W, which requires three states. The same exact thing happens when you combine two particles from a supersymmetric theory. The two particles are, first of all, the massless gravitino. Sorry, the massless, yeah, the massless, sorry, I didn't have 
Let's get the massless Goldstino. The massless Goldstino, where is it? Goldstino, come out, where are you? Well, some of the board. All right. The massless Goldstino has two spin states like the electron, exactly like the electron. And the massless Goldstino can either have its spin along the axis of motion or opposite to the axis of motion. There's another particle, which is the supersymmetric particle partner of the graviton. We haven't even talked about gravitons, but you all know they exist, or they have to exist in a gravitational theory. Uh, so what's the spin of the graviton? Two. Spin two. Right. The spin of its partner is not a half-spin particle. It's a spin three-halves particle. Spin two and spin three-halves form a multiplet. It's also massless because it's a partner of the graviton. So we have two kinds of massless fermions, and it's a fermion. So we have two kinds of massless fermions. They're distinct and they're different. One is the gravitino, which if it's moving along this axis can have spin three halves along that axis or spin minus three halves along that axis. But if it were massive, it would also have to have two other spin states, spin one half and spin minus one half. Right. It would have to have the rest of the full spin multiplet. It would have to have spin minus three halves, minus one half, plus one half, and spin three halves. Where does, where can those other two components come from? They can come from the Goldstino. All right. So the Goldstino combines together with the graviton in exactly the same pattern as the Goldstone boson can combine together with a gauge boson to make a massive object. That's believed to be the, to be the case. Of course, nobody knows that this theory is right. But if it is right, there will be a massive spin 3 halves particle, something we have never seen, an elementary particle of spin 3 halves. It will be a mass, massive spin three halves particle, but it will be as hard to produce in the laboratory as it is to produce a graviton. It will be no easier, which means you're not going to see it. Um, that's that's supersymmetry. I'm sure it's more than you thought you wanted to know about it. It's believe me, it's more than I want to know about it. But I, I have to know about it because I'm required to. It's part of my contract with Stanford. <laughs> and uh, um, we're absolutely finished with the mathematics of supersymmetry now. We'll come back to some of the physics of it, but not the mathematics of it. So that's the good news. Unfortunately, the bad news is that grand unification also is a somewhat mathematical subject. Not as bad, not nearly as abstract. The mathematics is a little bit of group theory. Maybe we should take a, a seven minute break. And then we're going to change subjects. We're going to change subjects to something much easier to understand. Uh, SU5. SU5 is a simple theory, not too hard to understand. So I heard now that this um, story about CP violation at uh, Fermilab seems to conflict with other experiments. And uh, people are less enthusiastic about it than they were. That's all. I, I, I'm just reporting. Uh, uh, what I overheard at uh, lunch one day. What's that? The other one bites the dust. Yeah. You can make a pretty good living betting against anything new in, the, in this business. I mean, you know, it's, it's very rarely will you be wrong. Of course, those times you'll really be wrong, but. Uh, all right, so. Um, the standard model is based on some group theory, SU3 cross SU2 cross U1. SU3 is the group of color, 
of quarks. SU2 is the weak interactions, and U1 is closely related to the electromagnetic interactions in a way that I'll be a little more precise about today than I was last, last time. Um, SU3 cross SU2 cross U1 is a group. It's a group that consists of separate transformations of three things, two things, or one thing. But people have wondered whether the whole structure could be embedded in some group which is more symmetric and more simple than SU3 cross SU2 cross U1. SU3 cross SU2 cross U1 fits in very nicely into the group SU5. And so it was asked whether, you know, numerous people asked, a small number of people answered, whether it was possible that there might be some bigger group in which a larger number of particles, okay, let's, let's, uh, in which a larger number of particles would fit together into a single multiplet. Remember that uh, the SU3 multiplets consist of the quarks. The SU2 multiplets, well, quarks have some SU2, but they also have some SU3, and uh, there are also leptons. Leptons have SU2, but they don't have SU3. The question is, might they all fit together in something more symmetric and bigger? And the natural candidate is SU5, and the reason is because SU3 cross, SU5 is the simplest group, the smallest group, that contains SU3 cross SU2 cross U1 as a subgroup. So I need to explain to you a little bit about what that means. And the easiest way to explain it is in terms of the generators of groups. SU5 is just the group of special unitary 5 by 5 matrices. Let me just remind you what's, what special means and what unitary means. You know what unitary means. Unitary means that u dagger u is equal to 1. And special means that the determinant of u is equal to 1. Uh, this doesn't mean absolute value. It means determinant. Determinant of u or the product of the eigenvalues determinant of u is equal to 1. In general, a unitary group can have a determinant which is a, which is a phase, e to the i theta. The special set is the set which has determinant u equal to 1. This can be translated into the generators of the group. Remember what the generators mean? It means that small deviate group elements, which are small deviations away from the identity, this is the identity element. This means the number 1. Uh, the small deviations away from the identity element, small infinitesimal transformations, can be written in the form of 1, that's the identity, plus i times its small number times one of the generators of the group. The generators of the group correspond to the different directions about which the different uh, independent um, directions of transformation that you can do. In the case of angular momentum, it will be the three axes. In the case of uh, SU5, there's some, sub, some independent set of generators. How many generators are there for, how many independent, linearly independent generators there are? Uh, we, we'll work that out in a minute, but the answer turns out to be eight. I think we've talked about that before. And so you characterize the group by the generators and the commutation relations among the generators. But before we do that, the unitary character of the group, of the group elements translates into the Hermitian character of G. So G is equal to G dagger. That's an abstract group statement, but it's also a concrete statement about 5 by 5, well, n by n matrices. 
We might as well now specialize to five by five matrices, but everything I say here is also true for n by n matrices. For group SU5, the generators, the five by five, all matrices are five by five matrices, and the generators, first of all, have to be Hermitian, and secondly, the determinant condition is the condition that the trace of G is equal to zero. Traceless Hermitian matrices. Now this is analogous to the Pauli matrices for SU2. The Pauli matrices for SU2 are Hermitian and they have no trace, they're traceless. So the Pauli matrices would be a special case. Let's see if we can count how many such independent matrices there are, five by five, linearly independent. Well, the five by five matrices, they're Hermitian. That means uh, that the, off di the on diagonal elements are real, and the off diagonal elements, these are real, 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 real. The on diagonal elements, off diagonal elements are complex in general, but when you reflect them about the axis, they just complex conjugate, and that's the character of a Hermitian matrix. So the question is, how many parameters are there, how many real parameters, real independent real parameters are there in such a matrix? Well, you start off with the total number of them, n by n, that's, uh, that's uh, n squared. Okay. It uh, looks like there's some constraints, c is equal to c dagger. However, that sounds like it cuts the number of uh, components in half, but not really, because a complex number has a real and imaginary part. So this is two independent components, or two independent real numbers, and these two together are simply two independent real numbers, just as they look. So the number of independent components of a square Hermitian matrix like this is n squared. But then we have to subtract one for the trace condition. The trace condition is that the sum of the diagonal elements add up to zero. And so the answer is there are n squared minus one generators of the group SUN. Let's just check that for the one case that we know. For SU2, n squared minus one would be two squared minus one would be three, and they would be the three Pauli matrices, or the three components of, uh, of uh, angular momentum would be an example, three components of spin. Okay, so for the case SU5, there are 24 independent, 25 minus one, 24 independent um, generators of the group. That's a lot, but we're not, fortunately, we're not going to have to deal with most of them. The question is, which subset of them, which subset of them correspond to the generators of SU3, SU2, and U1? All right, so that's, this is not hard to figure out. You can divide the five by five matrices into rows and columns, two of them here and three of them here, two of them here and three of them here. The two here are for SU2, okay? If you put up here in the corners the generators of SU2, the generators of SU2 are three generators, what are they, they're the Pauli matrices. In the context of spin, the Pauli matrices are usually called um, sigma. In the context of internal symmetries, they're often called tau. Tau 1, tau 2, tau 3, so I'll write them down over here. Tau 3 is just 1 minus 1, 0, 0. Tau 1 is 1, 1, 0, 0. And tau 2 is minus i, i, 0, 0. Okay, those are the three Pauli matrices. And if you just stick in this corner, the tau matrices, notice that they are traceless. They're already traceless. They are Hermitian. And you put zero everywhere else. These are the generators of SU2. 
These, the algebra of these, the commutation relations of them, everything about them is equivalent to the properties of the taus themselves. And so among the five by five matrices, generators, the subset which just live in this corner over here are generators of the group SU2. Okay. The ones down here, I won't write them down. There are eight of them. They're usually called lambda. It has nothing to do with a cosmological constant. There are eight of them. Right. Three by three. They're three by three Hermitian traceless matrices. Those are the generators of SU3. So, so, to, so to speak, SU2 lives up in here, and SU3 lives in here. Now, the SU2 and the SU3 matrices by themselves are traceless. There's one additional generator which commutes with all of these, which commutes with all of them, and which describes the U1 properties of elementary particles. So the U1 particle, and that's a diagonal matrix which has zero trace. It commutes with SU2 because it's proportional to the identity in here. Let's call it, let's see, what did I call it? Um, well, we could call it minus 1, minus 1. It doesn't matter. Minus 1 or plus 1 doesn't matter. Uh, you just change the sign of it. That would just, uh, it's, just a, it's a convention whether you put minus 1 or plus 1, uh, uh, plus 1 in here. But it's proportional to the unit matrix in the two-dimensional sub, uh, substructure here associated with two. With, so it's just a unit matrix with a minus sign in this case uh, that I put in here for reasons that have to do with old conventions. And then in here, you put, the whole thing has to be traceless, and I want to put something here which commutes with all the SU3 generators, all the SU2 generators. It has to be proportional to the unit matrix in here. And what do I need it to be? I need it to be, if this is 1, that this, so the trace of this is minus 1, I want 2 thirds, 2 thirds, and 2 thirds. 0 everywhere else. This generator has a name, it's called Y. It's a generator of SU5, which distinguishes the SU2 block from the SU3 block. It has different values in the SU2 block than it does in the SU3 block. In the SU2 block, it has values minus 1. In the SU3 block, it has value 2 thirds. I've chosen 2 thirds here. It was a convention that I put minus 1 here. I could have put anything here as long as these two were the same. But in order to make it have zero trace, in other words, to make the sum of the elements be zero, I had to put 2 thirds here. All right. These are the, the generators of the group that are important, that, uh, that label the states of particles. Okay, label the states of quarks and leptons to be exact. Or label the states of um, also Higgs bosons. And so now I will tell you how this structure works, how it's connected with the particles. Um, if we were just doing SU3 without SU2, I might put here, what would I put there? Quarks. I would say the SU3 matrices, the unitary and SU3 matrices, act on a column vector of quarks. What are the column vector? The colored quarks, red, yellow, and green, or whatever we call them, and mix them up among themselves. What about the SU2 block? In the SU2 block here, I could put, for example, neutrino and electron. Neutrino and electron are mixed by the SU2. There's five of them here. And so the question is, what particles shall I identify with the basic five-plet, with the basic five-dimensional column vector here that these SU5 transformations act on? All right, in order to answer that, 
Well, we'll answer it uh, by just some guessing and some, uh, some, some educated guessing. Okay. Um, but before we do it, let's write down the whole collection of fermions that are in the standard model. The whole collection of them. Now, I don't have to write the whole collection because they come in families. They come in three families, the electron, neutrino, up-down family, the uh, muon, neutrino, uh, charm, strange family, and the last family that involves the tau and the, uh, the, the other quarks. All right, so we just focus on one family now, the electron, neutrino, up quark, down quark family. Let's write them all down, count up how many there are, and see how we might fit them into representations of SU5. Now, why do we want to fit them into representations, or what would be the implications of fitting them into SU5? Remember that the symmetry group also has other implications. There are gauge bosons that go with the symmetry group. For example, for the SU3, what are the gauge bosons for the SU3 group? The, ga the, the gluons, all right? All right, so there are eight gluons associated with the eight generators of SU3. What about the uh, SU2 gauge bosons? Those have to do with the W plus, the W minus, and, uh, and Z and photon, the, some combination of Z and photon. Uh, so, right. So, there are going to be new gauge bosons. The new gauge bosons, there are going to be 24 of them. Up till now, we had 2 plus 8 is 10. There'll be 14 more gauge bosons. The 14 more gauge bosons will be associated with these corners in here, and they will have implications. There will be new interactions, new forces associated with them, new kinds of particles, and that's what we want to get after. All right, so let's write down all of the particles. Now, before I do so, I have to tell you something else. As you know, fermions come in left-handed and right-handed types. The left-handed fermions are the ones which interact weakly with the weak interactions. Only left-handed fermions have the SU2. The right-handed fermions don't. Right-handed fermions have no weak interactions. Okay? Only left-handed fermions have weak interactions. On the other hand, the color interactions are there among all quarks, both left-handed and right-handed. So this is an odd sort of peculiar structure. Uh, the SU2 cross U1 is usually identified as SU2 cross U1 of left-handed particles, not right-handed particles. Now, the relationship between left-handed particles and right-handed particles is the following. Well, one is left-handed and one is right-handed. But there's another way to think about it. You can think of it as particle and antiparticle. The antiparticle of a right-handed particle is itself left-handed. It is not the left-handed, the, the, uh, the antiparticle of a, of a left-handed electron is, sorry, is a right-handed positron. Handedness changes when you go from particle to antiparticle. That means you could, you, you could label all of the particles as left-handed, if you like. Among the electrons, for example, you could say the independent electron states are left-handed electron, left-handed positron, and their antiparticles. The antiparticle the antiparticle of the left-handed electron is the right-handed positron. And the antiparticle of the left-handed positron is the right-handed electron. So you could either say that the independent objects are 
particles and antiparticles, but you could also just say, I insist on labeling all of the independent objects as left-handed and their antiparticles. Just concentrate on the left-handed objects, label all objects as left-handed or the antiparticles of left-handed particles. That's another way to, uh, to describe all of the fermions of the standard model. They can all be thought of as left-handed or the antiparticles of left-handed particles. So that's what we'll do. We'll focus on the left-handed particles, and let's see how many of them there are. Let's just add up everything. There's the left-handed neutrino. The left-handed neutrino, now how do I know the neutrino is left-handed? It's just let the neutrinos that come out of beta decay are left-handed. There's the left-handed electron. And I, I'm going to stop calling them left-handed. They're all left-handed. They're all left-handed. The up quark. No, I didn't want to write though. The down quark, the down, the anti-down quarks. Now, I haven't written, I have obviously have not written all particles down. I've written down only five here. Five? Uh-huh. SU5. But uh, why did I write down this five? We'll see in a moment. Those are six. six. What's that? Six. Six? Oh, one, two, three. Wait, hold on. What did I write here? U quark. No U quark. Forget the U quark. Neutrino, electron, down bar, down bar, down bar. What are these three here? What does that stand for? The three colors. The three colors. All right, so this is one subset. And why I've broken them up this way will become clear in a minute. Okay, the next subset, the, the remaining ones over here, I will simply list also. Uh, let's see what they are. They're down, 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 up bar, up bar, oops, down, 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 up, 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 up bar, up bar, up bar, and E plus. This is E minus. Electron, positron. Oh. Among the electron, up quark, down quark, they're all here. Here's the electron, here's the positron. It is not believed, and certainly not in the standard model, the neutrino is its own antiparticle. So there is not a separate antiparticle for the neutrino. The electrons, here's the two antiparticles. Here are the three down quarks. Here are their antiparticles. Here are the three up quarks. Here are the antiparticle. And here is the positron. They're all there. Okay? The fact that I wrote them in this way, I just chose to write them in this list. There are five over here, and I hope ten over here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay? So altogether, there are 15 particles. Now these 15 particles are replicated three times. The electron neutrino system gets replicated as the muon, muon neutrino. This is the electron neutrino. Uh, this gets replicated three times. All of these get replicated three times. But let's not worry about the replication and where that comes from. Nobody knows where that comes from. Uh, good. Now the reason, let me show you why I, um, why I chose this particular pattern here. It's pretty clear that what goes up in here, if I want to write a column vector now of fermions, it's pretty clear that what goes up in here should not have color, right? Why? Because SU3 doesn't act on the, first two, uh, on the first two slots here. SU2 acts on it, SU3 does not. So the first two slots here should be things which have no color, but which mix up under SU2. In other words, which mix up under these SU, uh, under these SU2 transformations, tau. All right, so what can that be? Well, neutrino and electron mix up under uh, left-handed neutrino and left-handed electron 
get mixed up by SU2. And they don't have color. So it's the only thing you could put over here would be neutrino electron. Now the fact that I put neutrino on top and electron underneath it, to some extent that's convention. All right, so the reason I put neutrino on top, electron underneath is just because that's the way it's usually written. What should I put down here? Now down here I want to put quarks, but those quarks have SU3 but no SU2. Which of the quarks have SU3 but no SU2? Anybody know? The right-handed quarks. Left-handed quarks have weak interactions. That's SU2. The right-handed quarks don't. But I haven't listed right-handed quarks here. I've listed all particles as, uh, as either left-handed particles or left-handed antiparticles. The group here which don't have weak interactions are the antiparticles uh, are the are the anti quarks? Where's d bar? U bar and d bar. These are the ones that do not have any SU two properties. They are the anti particles of the right handed quarks. The right handed quarks are not the ones that interact in beta decay in the weak interactions. They are neutral, or they don't transform under SU2. And neither do their antiparticles. So these are the guys here, if you label everything as left-handed, these are the people here which don't transform under SU2. Which of these two do I want to put in this slot? OK, so now I will tell you how you figure that out. You say one of the gauge bosons is going to have to be the photon. The photon couples to electric charge. The electric charge must be one of the generators of this SU5. Otherwise, the whole thing wouldn't make sense. Uh, the SU5 quantum numbers are supposed to be all of the quantum numbers of the electroweak QCD color theory, all of them. What does that mean? That means the electric charge, the color quantum numbers, and the things which have to do with Z and W. The electric charge has to be one of the generators of SU5. But all of the generators of SU5 are traceless. What does that mean? That means that, means that in a given multiplet, the sums of the electric charge within a given multiplet have to add up to 0. That's the statement that uh, the, uh, the generators of SU5 or anything else, it's, it's exactly the same thing as uh, saying you have a plus 1 and a minus 1. If a thing, if there's a, if there's a multiplet of, uh, of uh, tau 3, let's say spin, one of them is going to be up, one of them is going to be down. The sums of the two spins, the z components of spin, add up to 0. Same thing for SU5. If you have a multiplet of SU5 particles that transforms under SU5, any given generator, if it describes a quantum number, the sums of those quantum numbers must add up to 0. So whatever we put here has to be such that the electric charges all add up to 0. This has 0 electric charge. This has electric charge minus 1. So the sum here must add up to plus 1. Which of these particles has charge which adds up to plus 1? That's this one. D quarks have charge minus a third. Anti D quarks have charge plus a third. So 0, I'll just write the charges down, 0, minus 1. And now if I put the anti D quarks here, this all together has charge plus one. Plus one, plus one, plus one. Uh, sorry. Plus a third, plus a third, plus a third. And the sums of all of them equal zero. If I were to put the U quarks there, or the anti U quarks, they have charge two thirds. Forget this here. They have charge two thirds, and the charges would not have added up to zero. OK? So it's a matter of group. It's, it comes from. The, ultimately, it comes 
from the, uh, the, trace, the tracelessness of the generators of the group that we're trying to label the particles by. We're labeling them by generators of SU5 and the sums of elements of SU5 always add up to zero. All right, so the sums of these charges have to add up to zero. That picks out the dequarks there. Or the anti-dequarks. Anti-dequarks because those are the ones that do not have SU2 quantum numbers. Don't get mixed up by SU2. And it really is that way. I mean, this is, uh, the particles really are that way. But where do we put the rest of the particles? The rest of the particles, there are 10 of them. So the next question is, is there, it's 9 o'clock. That's the next question. We're going to come back to this. We'll fill out the remaining 10 particles in another representation of SU5. Not a five-dimensional representation, but guess what? A 10-dimensional representation. There is a 10-dimensional representation. Right? There is a 10-dimensional representation. And the 10-dimensional representation has exactly the right properties to be the remainder of these particles here. This is either a fantastic accident uh, or it, uh, something deep. And I, I don't think it's an accident. The remaining particles here exactly fill out the 10-dimensional representation of SU5. So we'll come back to that next time. And I'll show you how that works. I don't understand how the different representations of the same group can allow that whole thing to have a group structure. No, the, these particles do not get mixed with these under the group transformations. They don't interact with each other? Oh, they do interact with each other, but uh, not by, uh, by, not by um, yeah, they do interact with each other, but there is no gate. OK, so let's, good, good question. All right. The, let's take the gluon, for example. All right. One of these particles can emit a gluon and become one of the other ones. They cannot emit a gluon and become one of these. But a D bar can emit a gluon which is absorbed by a U quark, for example. So the generators take the generators, which are the same as the, uh, as the emission matrix elements for the gluons here. They take one quark to another. They take these to these, these to these. But they don't take this to this. However, that doesn't mean they don't interact. Right. Okay. Same thing here, same thing. All of the generators of SU5 mix these up among themselves, mix these up among themselves, do not mix these with these. But that simply means that in order to have this side interact with this side, you have to emit and then absorb. So you can have the, f the group of five over here interact with the group of 10 over here by exchange of gauge bosons. OK? Yeah. Yeah. Also, the Higgs boson gets into it and makes them interact. Yeah. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.